Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to this Copernicus Climate Change Service uh, webinar. This is under the Contract for Energy Operational Service. Today, we are going to present uh, the work that has been done under this contract in regards to the energy models. I will uh, give you a brief introduction. I am the Alberto Chocli, the leader of the C3S energy contract, and, uh, and, and then we'll go on to the uh, uh, more specific presentations later, but I wanted to give you a bit of context for the contract overall. So the contract started from the two proof of concept contracts that preceded the C3S Energy Operational Service and these were the uh, theme for energy on your left. This is a representation of the visual demonstrator that was produced with that contract and on the right you have the European Climatic Energy Mixes representation with the uh, uh, demonstrator there. Both of them are still available uh, but they are not uh, kept up to date at the moment because we are transitioning onto this new operational service. So that on, at the bottom you can see that the project started in May uh, 2018 and uh, we're now about halfway through and the contract will end at in April 2020 as it stands, but the idea is that this should be an operational service that will continue and provide useful data and products for the energy community. So the consortium that, that is working on this contract uh, is composed of the following organizations. I'll let you go through them. The, the slides will be available also after the presentation, but you can also uh, have much more information on the websites that will be given at the end. The uh, rationale for this uh, contract, the C3S Energy Operational Service, is that we want to produce something that is useful in terms of climate service for the energy uh, community. So we're not just providing climate data, we are going uh, beyond and uh, computing, as we will hear today, quantities that uh, have the units of watts, megawatts, megajoule, and so on, which are the units that are actually required to run a grid and and uh, other energy operations. Um, normally, people in the climate stop at capacity factors, which are useful, but they don't actually uh, allow you to compare particularly demand and supply because demand normally doesn't come as a capacity factor but um, as, a, as an energy unit itself. And so with this we'd also continue to bridge the communication gap between the climate community and the energy community. There's a lot of uh, work uh, that we're doing in terms of uh, engagement, the stakeholder engagement, and we also uh, in, the, in, in the process strengthening the knowledge of climate scientists so they can be better prepared to speak with energy experts. Um, so the, uh, sorry, the, just to give you a flavor for the data that are being used and the products that are being produced, um, we have uh, the uh, two, uh, three streams. One is what we call historical, which covers the, the period between 79 and present. We have seasonal forecast, so this is our operational forecast produced every month. And at the moment, we are focusing on three models. Two of them are uh, nearly available, and the third one is being added. And then projections, uh, mainly Eurocortex. So the domain at the moment is Europe. So we use the Eurocortex because they offer a higher spatial resolution and tempo as well. And we have 12 models for those projections. Uh, in terms of uh, climate indicators, we have the main uh, climate variables that are useful for energy, so which are temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, wind speed, uh, both at 10 meter, 100 meter, and mean sea level pressure. We are also looking to uh, process uh, relative humidity 
as an additional variable that could be useful for, uh, for some of the applications. In terms of energy indicators, we have electricity demand, hydropower, both for runoff river and reservoir, solar power focusing only on PV um, due to the uh, higher um, use of PV at the moment, uh, not so much on concentrating solar power. And then we have wind power both on and offshore, and we will hear a lot more about this, particularly the energy indicators very soon. And we have a flow, so this is just uh, uh, to give you an idea that we have a process to go from the uh, all the steps that go from the climate data to the energy data, and then uh, provide it as a, as a visual um, tool as well, as well as data that can be downloaded and, and plots and, and so on. You get an idea also looking at the current demonstrators that I presented on uh, at the beginning for C4E and ESIM. Now, the agenda for today, uh, we have uh, three great talks. Um, the first one is on the electricity demand model, second one on solar power, and third one on hydropower. We have two uh, speakers, the people that are behind uh, the models and uh, very knowledgeable about uh, the uh, topic, uh, the first one is uh, Dr. Laurent Dubu from ADF um, in France, and the second one is Dr. Yves Maurice Saint Renan from Mean Paritech, also France, and then the uh, third one again from uh, uh, Dr. Laurent Dubu with uh, other collaborators as well, hey, as he will mention. Um, then we'll have a question and answer session uh, for about 10 minutes at the end where we uh, you can type the questions uh, anytime and then we collect all the questions and answer them to you um, by the uh, speakers normally. The webinar is also recorded and will be available online. So enjoy the webinar. I will now give the floor to the first speaker and uh, Dr. Laurent Dubu and, and uh, he will tell you about the electricity demand model. Hello, good morning, good afternoon or good evening everyone. Uh, is my screen sharing okay, Alberto? Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Laurent. Okay, so thank you. Um, so the first talk will be about the electricity demand models uh, that we set up with my colleague Johan Moreau. Uh, basically, for those of you who uh, know about ESEM, it was basically the same approach. Uh, but before getting into the details, I will just remind you some um, basic points about the energy model strategy we developed in the project. Um, so basically, all the energy models, so by energy models, I mean uh, the models to convert climate data into energy data. Uh, they are all built on uh, the era five period, so on the reanalysis analysis period from 1979 to 2018, using uh, publicly available data, which uh, in this case are the NSOE energy data, NSOE being the uh, uh, European Network for Transmission System Operators for Energy. Uh, and then once the models are built, the idea is to use these uh, with the seasonal forecast and the climate predictions with some slight adjustments, but basically these will, uh, these will remain the same models. Uh, of course, the advantage of this uh, approach is that it limits the effort uh, in setting up the models uh, over the free uh, temporal stream, uh, but still the effort uh, remains important, as you can imagine. And uh, uh, the other advantage is that models can be assessed properly based on actual data over the past. Um, but of course, uh, there are some limitations, which is that uh, uh, the uh, essential climate variables, ECVs, uh, needs to be bias adjusted if necessary, uh, so as to represent uh, as accurately as possible the, the real state of climate. Um, and uh, the other constraint is that uh, we need good quality and long enough records of energy data to set up and validate the models. These tables give you an overview of the current status of the uh, energy indicators developed in the, in the contract. Uh, so basically, red cross, uh, green crosses ticks are for uh, what is already done and, and available, not yet publicly, but soon. Uh, and the, the, the yeah, the, this, I don't know the English term for this symbol, but uh, it shows what is uh, currently developed. Uh, keeping in mind that the, the black crosses uh, mean the, the indicator will not be provided 
uh, for some reasons I won't go I won't go into details there. So uh, you can see that uh, it's a lot of work in parallel and some uh, some uh, indicators are already available at least at the country level, not zero, also at country level uh, over the historical period. Um, one of the big issues I already mentioned and I want to emphasize is that to set up these models, we need good energy data. Uh, as uh, Copernicus is from the European Commission, we need to rely on publicly and open uh, access data. Uh, so that's why we choose the NSOE data set, uh, which has improved a lot in the last, in the last years. Uh, nonetheless, there are still some issues. I won't go into the details there. We don't have time, but, uh, uh, the, the, the quality of what we built is, uh, uh, of course, dependent of some limitations of the entry database, which improves which with time and uh, which is a very good basis because it provides a, a good overview of all, over all EU countries uh, for the data we need. Um, so let's come now to the uh, electricity demand models. So basically, it's the same approach as in ESEM, for those of, of you who know that. Uh, the base, the methodology, so it's statistical models and uh, more precisely generalized additive models. Uh, there's a, a bunch of literature about that. And the um, input climate variables that we use are uh, temperature at two meters, uh, global horizontal radiation and wind speed at 10 meters. And in addition to that, we also use calendar data. Uh, by calendar data, I mean uh, to know if a specific day is a weekday or a weekend, a Monday or Wednesday, a uh, normal day or holiday or bank holiday and so on, which is very important for the, uh, for, the for the demand modeling. And basically the approach we took is that for um, most countries, we have observations of, uh, of load of demand from 2006 to 2018, the, the best case. Uh, for a few countries, we have much less data. And so in the first step, uh, we estimate the trend of the signal on this period, uh, which more or less is due to uh, economic activity and population growth and so on. And then we fix this uh, trend and remove it uh, so as to get, uh, let's say, something like a stationary signal. Uh, then in the second step, we split the, uh, the, the available data in two. Uh, one is kept for calibration. Uh, during which we, we set up really the, the model, which links the climate variables to the, uh, to the load. And then the other period is used in step three uh, to validate the model. And then once the model has been validated, so there are some iterations to optimize the parameters of each model for each country individually. And then once the, uh, the parameters are uh, estimated to be okay and the validation is good enough, uh, we use this model with the entire ERA-5 data set to reconstruct what the demand would have been over the whole period from 1979. Uh, and once again, it's important to keep in mind that the, uh, the assumption behind that is that the um, reconstructed demand over the whole period behaves like if uh, the, uh, um, the shape of the demand had been the same over, over all the time, which means that we don't take into account in that uh, population growth effects and uh, economic trend effects and so on because they have been removed at the beginning. And the, um, the rationale behind that is that we want to uh, use this data for demand in, uh, in parallel with, uh, for instance, wind, uh, wind capacity factor reconstruction and solar capacity factor reconstruction and so on, uh, which are built in the, same, in the same spirit. So in brief, what we want to do is really to model uh, the effect of climate variability on demand and, and then on wind and solar um, capacity factors and hydro capacity factors, uh, uh, leaving uh, all of the parameters aside. Um, just to come back to the uh, input data, here uh, are the data from ENSOI, uh, which, by the way, have changed their, uh, their portal, their data portal several times in the, in the last years uh, with a very significant improvement. So the demand data we use are what they call the monthly hourly load values, which are available in their statistical uh, portal. Uh, so basically it's uh, hourly or even sub-hourly data for some countries, but we work here on a daily resolution. Uh, maybe hourly resolution will be possible in the future, but for now we, we keep with the hourly, with the daily resolution. So in that 
figure you can see the time series which are available in that portal for all the countries in Europe. Um, the, the blue curve is for the most recent version of the portal and the, the red one is for the oldest one. And you can see that for some countries we have uh, pretty good data. I can mention France, uh, for instance, but also let's say Finland and, uh, and uh, Portugal and so on. But for some countries, obviously, you can see that there are some issues. For instance, for Denmark, for which you have a shift between 2010 and after 2010. Uh, and some other countries, you can see that there are some strange features there. Uh, so there are explanations for those uh, problems in the data. Some of them have been identified. We are still working on that uh, to identify some of them. But basically, you uh, can realize that it's not totally easy to handle this kind of data and to use them to set up uh, good models. But nonetheless, uh, the data exists. It's for all countries in Europe, and it's a, it's a very good point. So I, I'm going just to show you briefly now the result for uh, for a few countries. Uh, so basically, on the on the left panel, you have the three uh, periods that have been used for France. So you can see that on, on the period number one, so from 2010 to 2018. Uh, the trend is estimated, and in that case, you can see that the trend is uh, uh, almost inexistent. There's no trend in this in this, in this data for France because uh, demand has been uh, quite stationary, apart from the high frequency variability, of course, in the last few years. So the uh, nonetheless, the trend is estimated on this full period, and then. Um, we split the, 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 the period in two, so the first one is 2010 to 2014 included, uh, in which we really estimate the parameters of the model, and then uh, we use the 2015 to 2018 climate variables to uh, calculate the demand based on this, on this model. Uh, and once this is done, this model is taken with the full period uh, 1979 to 2018 uh, to reconstruct what the demand would have been in France over this period if the uh, climate to demand relationship had been the same all over the time. Uh, and that's the, the bottom uh, right panel. So this has been done for uh, almost every country in Europe. I think we have now 28 or 29 countries out of 32, which are done. Um, here, are, here is a basic validation plot for France. So on the x-axis, you have the uh, reference load from ENSOE. And on the uh, y-axis is the reconstruction. Uh, the color, the dots, are, are, are to distinguish between, uh, between months. Of course, you can see that the, the demand in France is, is much higher in winter because of electric heating, principally. And uh, you can see that the, the quality of the reconstruction although the validation period is really good in that case. I think it's the best case uh, of all the countries. And that's why I showed it. Uh, just to mention that with good input data, uh, we can do very good, uh, very good models. Uh, the uh, mean absolute percentage error in that case is something like 1.2%, which is very good and uh, quite close to uh, actual operational models. Another example here is for Austria. Uh, where well, you can see that on the validation uh, plot, it's not too bad neither. The correlation is very good as well. Uh, but you can see on this example that we uh, really needed to uh, reduce the uh, uh, the training period uh, starting in 2011 in that case, because uh, before 2011, there was a, a shift in the, an, up, an upset in the data from NSOE, uh, which we uh, uh, could identify with the help of the uh, Austrian TSO, and it's com it comes from a change in the, in the reporting methodology they use. Um, a last example, which is for Belgium, uh, where you can see that, again, uh, the fit is not as good as for France, but it, it, it's, not, it's not bad at all, and uh, it gives a, a, quite, a, quite a good uh, representation of, of what the demand is in that country. Um, I will not show all the individual plots. They will be available in a later report. Uh, but here you have the uh, global validation as scatter plots for all the countries uh, which are available so far. So on the uh, 2015 to 2018 period, uh, keep in mind that all those countries were not um, trained and validated over the same periods. That's why for some of them, the, the scatter plots look really ugly 
for Luxembourg, for instance. But uh, more or less, you can see that uh, for most countries, we have quite a good fit uh, on this data with correlation coefficients larger than 0.95 for most of them, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, for instance, Luxembourg, we have some problems for uh, Lithuania and UK as well. Uh, but more or less for, for most countries, the, the fit is really good. That's all for this uh, first presentation. Thank you, Alberto. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, I would like to remind people, we're not taking questions now, but uh, please uh, type your question now so that we can have them ready at the end of the pre all presentations and then answer them. Uh, so you can type questions at any time, as I said. But now we go to the second talk on uh, the solar photovoltaic modeling by Yves-Marie uh, saint Drenan. So Yves-Marie, over to you, please. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, can you see my, my, my screen right now? Yes, we can. Yeah, all good. Okay, Thank so you. I can start. So after this uh, very nice presentation on the energy demand, I would like to introduce uh, our calculation to estimate uh, the solar power generation in the European domain. Um, so in this presentation, um, I, 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 it's uh, built in three main parts. In the first part, I would like to introduce my approach for the calculation of the regional PV power generation. Um, after that, uh, I will uh, show a uh, first validation of this approach and finally an adaptation of this approach uh, for the operational implementation within the, the C3, C3S energy uh, framework. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, this last step was needed because the calculation is quite time consuming and we needed to uh, simplify this implementation to make it uh, faster without losing too much uh, accuracy. But first, um, I would like to present um, the, the core of this uh, calculation. And for this, um, I start with this slide which shows, um, uh, I would say, the, the, the basic uh, part of this calculation, which is a, the simulation of the output of a PV plant uh, from meteorological data. For this, I, I took uh, the results of uh, some sensitivity analysis I conducted uh, in the framework of my uh, PhD thesis, where I showed that you can have a very good um, or a sufficient, um, an acceptable accuracy if you set all parameters of a PV systems to standard reference values, uh, except the module uh, orientation angles. So the orientation angle and the tilt angle of the PV panel. And this is the approach we are we are used for. Therefore, for all. Um, all characteristic of a PV systems, we set the, 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 the value to reference standard values based on statistic analysis, uh, except for the modular orientation. Um, and for this, uh, these two angles, I will show the, the approach we are taking afterwards. But before, I would like to put things into context because um, in in this work, uh, we are considering not the power generation of each single plant, because it's always a question then, uh, what is uh, the orientation of the PV plant we are considering? So this is not the, 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 the quantity we, we, we tend to address. Uh, we have the, 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 the intention in this framework to deliver some uh, energy variable for for the energy mix. So we are not considering single plant, but ensemble of PV plants. So we are speaking about regional PV model. And the, the difference is that we are not considering single installation, but a mix of PV systems with different 
uh, orientation, different characteristics, and so on and so on. And in this small example, you see that we have a new uh, challenge now is to see how we can uh, assess the mix of uh, different different characteristics of the PV systems. As I said before, we are only have to uh, find a, a way to 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 assess the the model orientation. So the the question we are trying to answer now is to know how to to take into into consideration the the, the 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 mix of different orientation in a given area so first uh, we need some mathematical framework for this and this is presented in this slide our approach is to simulate the most frequent orientation so i don't know 20 uh, degree inclination orientation to the south 30 degree inclination orientation to the south and so on and so on and for each of this orientation, we want to assess the, the share of occurrence so that at the end, we just uh, have to make a weighted sum of the power output of the reference configuration, the weight being the share of the installed capacity uh, represented by each reference uh, configuration. This is illustrated in this uh, equation but to implement it we need a way to estimate the distribution function rho in this uh, in this equation so how did you with that um we started from um uh, um a data base of uh, of pv plan for germany which is made of uh, circa 35,000 PV plants where we know the, the, the nominal capacity, the peak power, the module orientation, and the module tilt angle. With this data set, we evaluated the joint distribu distribution function of uh, the module tilt and azimuth angle, which is represented on the uh, right plot of this figure. And now we want to approximate this uh, joint distribution in order to generalize it to any country in uh, in uh, in Europe so this is uh, our goal now the first approximation is just to consider that uh, this joint distribution is uh, is a is a product of two Gaussian distribution the first for the orientation and the second one for the the tilt angle uh, this implies the assumption that the two distributions are independent. This is not uh, it's not really true, as you can see in this plot. But as a first approximation, it's it's uh, it can be accepted. And then we can express this distribution using four parameters because you use the product of two Gaussian par parameterization. Um, and these four parameters are the mean value and the uh, standard deviation of the tilt angle and the mean value and the standard deviation of the azimuth angle okay now we can we make the following assumption uh, i think whatever the country we can assume that the most or the average orientation will be to the south so i think it is something we can accept and we will consider that the distribution of orientation among south uh, will be the same in each country uh, so we can use the value of Germany for each other country now considering the tilt angle for Germany we found a tilt angle of uh, 24,5 degree and uh, and standard deviation of 10.8 degree of course, this value cannot be used for Spain or Norway, so we need to, to, to fix them. So our approach is to say that the average value of the tilt angle is, uh, is equal to a factor times the optimal tilt angle. The optimal tilt angle will be different in different regions of Europe, depending on the latitude and on the share of diffuse to direct ratio. 
So uh, if we say that this factor of 0 0.7 is constant um, uh, throughout Europa, we can uh, we can parameterize this mean value of the tilt angle uh, using the optimal tilt angle. So the next question is uh, how can we find this tilt angle? Actually, we have some data set, for example, one of the PVGs uh, that contain already this uh, optimal tilt angle. And using this uh, product, we can therefore evaluate the mean tilt angle for any place in Europa. Considering the standard deviation, we will consider that the standard deviation um, is the same everywhere in Europa. So, using this approach, we can now implement our model everywhere in Europa. And uh, we did that. We made a first validation using uh, ERA interim data. And uh, we did this validation. Uh, so, in uh, C3S Energy, we are using ERA5 data, and we are currently uh, making the validation for, for uh, ERA5, but we all already have some results using ERA interim. It is the same model, so now I'm just speaking about the validation of the model. And an update of this validation using ERA5 will be conducted in the, in the next time. So we used two cases uh, that we very well know. It is Germany and France. We know exactly, or we have a lot of expertise on the estimated uh, regional PV power generation provided by the transmission system operator on the one hand. And we have a lot of expertise on the uh, information on the installed capacity. And this allowed us to make a validation. And now I just show you the, 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 the main result of this validation in terms of of scatter plot of the estimation against the the, the the TSO data. So you can see that our estimation is uh, very, um, represent quite well the value provided by the transmission system operators. Of course, we have some noise in this data, but the results are really satisfying. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a validation using ERA interim on a three hourly data set. So in the next time, we will do the same job using the ERA five data. So I, I end up uh, very fast uh, using the simplification of this model. Why? This model, I think, is uh, very good because it's really general. We can implement it anywhere without having to look for a lot of information in each country. The drawback is that uh, it is a computational computationally in, uh, intensive. So we need to find a, a, a way to do that to address this issue and um, uh, we have therefore an update of this model which consists in an, a simplification of the calculation procedure. Uh, the, the, well, what we should say is that uh, the model is implemented on the climate projection and on the seasonal forecast, so there is some, some strong constraint on the, on the computation procedure. And, and, um, in this uh, application, there is some daily value that needs to be com com computed, computed. So we uh, made this com simplification to make the model work on a daily value. So we built daily average of the some input data, some features, as well uh, as um, daily value of the calculated uh, capacity factor using the detailed model. And for each uh, location in Europa, we made some um, some um, some learning of the output of the detailed model using some features. And the features are the following: the so daily average uh, global horizontal irradiation, the top of atmosphere irradiation, the two meter temperature, and the diffuse fraction. So this is a result of some data analysis, and we found out that using these features and their cross uh, product, we can have very good uh, approximation of our model, so that we have the same, uh, almost no loss of accuracy using a very fast model. 
Uh, and this is on the right side some example of the model output uh, against uh, uh, the, the detailed model output. And as you can see, the, the noise is really limited. So we have a very good uh, speed up uh, uh, improvement and a very small loss of accuracy. And this is really a big improvement for the operational chain uh, for the seasonal forecast and the climate projection. Okay, I just conclude now. So we propose an approach for calculating the PV uh, power, PV uh, capacity factor in Europe. And the big advantage of this model is that we need no information except from the optimal slope for using this model. And those optimal slope can be uh, taken from data sets such as the one provided by PVGs. A first validation has been made using TSO data, uh, which shows satisfactory result. This preliminary validation was done using ERA interim, but it is going to be, uh, is currently being done with uh, ERA5 data now. Um, and now for the implement, the operational implementation in C3S energy, uh, we simplified the model to speed up the calculation while uh, losing the, the less accuracy as possible. Um, this model is currently uh, implemented at Meteo France for the seasonal uh, forecast, and it's uh, current, currently being uh, implemented at IPSL for calculating climate projection. Uh, it's also implemented on the virtual machine of, uh, of uh, Copernicus for, uh, for uh, calculating the uh, reanalysis. Thank you very much for your attention. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Yves Marie, uh, for uh, this uh, pretty comprehensive uh, look at uh, the model. There's always simplifications, as you can see, but uh, the, the results are quite impressive, um, especially because we need to apply this for all countries in Europe for now and later perhaps beyond. So there, there needs to be some simplification. Also, as uh, we've seen so far, the models that we are presenting are based on uh, the historical period, but the idea is that to implement the same for seasonal forecast as also if Marie pointed out. So um, a lot to take in and uh, another talk now with uh, a, a lot of information again. So um, we'll, uh, we'll now look at hydropower and wind power and then we'll take some questions but um, all the presentations will be available and uh, you can also contact us later because I understand there is a lot to take in with all this information now. So over to you Laurent. Thank you very much again for um, the other talk now. Thank you, Alberto. Um, so I will now present briefly wind uh, generation and uh, in more details hydropower. Uh, this work uh, was done with uh, Lin O, oh, with a, a scientist at WMC, and Salomo Baunje, with uh, an intern uh, working with me here at TDF. Um, so I will start very briefly by wind because it's very similar to what we did in ESEM and it's very simple. Uh, so there's not, uh, not much technical details behind that. So the idea is just basically to use the gridded uh, wind speed data uh, from ERA5 or uh, seasonal forecast and climate projections. And for each grid point uh, to consider there is one single wind turbine of a predetermined type. Um, and to compute the uh, capacity factor using the, the wind speed which is available. So it's very simple and then we aggregate at uh, country level or sub-country level uh, referring to nodes 2 and node 0 levels. Uh, so the only uh, difference with ESEM is that first we updated the, the, the wind turbine types we considered and also we split uh, between onshore and offshore um, wind turbines, so with a more uh, powerful, let's say, uh, wind turbine time for offshore. So the choice is indicated here uh, with an 8 megawatt turbine for offshore and then 3.45 megawatts uh, onshore, uh, which were chosen based on uh, uh, expert knowledge uh, here at EDF. Um, so basically, we take the uh, wind speed 
uh, at 100 meters. Uh, we've set the, uh, uh, the, the hub height uniformly to 100 meters because the, uh, this level is available in ERA 5 in particular. So the grid is uh, 0.25 by 0.25 degree. And we use those um, power curves uh, to compute the uh, capacity factor uh, as, a, as the output. Uh, so basically, we end up for a specific date. So this is the 1st of January 2017 at zero UTC. Uh, so you get uh, one file for onshore wind capacity factor and one for offshore. And so we can run the, the full the full period uh, in era five, all the signal forecasts, all the climate projections, and we end up with the, the capacity factors um, on the grid, uh, which then be uh, which then can be uh, aggregated at uh, sub country or country level. So it's really basic. Uh, some improvements may be developed in the future, but that, that's the simplest way to handle that. And uh, when you aggregate at country level, uh, you get very good correlations with the actual uh, capacity factor. Of course, the level is not the right one because you don't consider the exact uh, location of all the wind turbines and their exact type and their exact up eight. So it, there's a lot of approximations there, but uh, basically the the, 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 the high production periods and low production periods are very well reproduced. I just forgot to mention that ERA5 being at uh, hourly uh, resolution, we provide these capacity factor data sets at hourly resolution. I will now skip to hydropower and uh, uh, just remind uh, as an introduction the goal of that. So uh, like for demand and wind and solar, the idea is developed um, is to reconstruct uh, hydropower generation from reservoirs and a runoff river uh, from 1979, but to just focus on the effects of climate viability on this hydropower generation. Um, initially, we uh, wanted to use uh, quite uh, complex models, taking every single um, hydropower plant in Europe with its characteristics and using uh, river flow data for each of those to be able to uh, to, um, to calculate the hydropower production. Uh, the problem is that the necessary uh, data to do that are not available uh, yet. They may become available in the future, but they are not yet. And so we use the simplified approach, uh, which I will now describe. So basically, uh, using ENSOE data, you can split the hydropower generation into two parts. The first one is uh, what is called runoff river, where you don't have a, a reservoir, basically, and uh, the water flows through the turbine directly. And the other uh, type of hydropower is reservoir-based, in which you have a dam uh, which stores the water and uh, can be used on demand uh, by the uh, system operator. Of course, the link between climate and uh, runoff river is more direct than is the link between uh, reservoir generation and climate, because uh, there is some management options in the reservoirs. That's why uh, they are done for. And so uh, the link is less obvious uh, because there's uh, the, uh, the, the, the strategy that is taken by the, the, the dam manager uh, to optimize the use of his, uh, of his water in the reservoir. Um, so the initial uh, models were uh, imagined and developed by Matteo De Felice during the ESM contract. Uh, basically, the idea is to have a very simplified approach uh, by which the target variables are either the uh, country aggregated runoff generation or country aggregated reservoirs generation. And uh, this is um, calculated uh, using uh, temperature, precipitation, and eventually snow depth uh, aggregated at country level uh, to, to model the, the, the generation. Um, basically, what we did initially was to use uh, uh, instantaneous temperature and precipitation, so they are the same time step than the generation, and uh, also to add uh, time lagged variables. Uh, so uh, initially we added a 30 day lag for temperature and uh, what we call an optimal lag. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you have the case, I think it's France. Uh, we estimated this optimal lag by taking the uh, cumulated precipitation over a varying number of days between 0 and 200. And we uh, took the, the optimal lag as the one which maximized the correlation uh, between uh, the generation uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the lag variable. So for instance, in the case of France, we use uh, accumulated precipitation on 120 days 
as an explaining as a as a predictor. Um, when we extended the uh, the work for the current contract, we had more data from NSOE, and we realized that uh, this uh, way of doing was not optimal and uh, even was not was not robust enough. Uh, so we developed a new approach. Uh, by which we um, took as input variables, so temperature, precipitation, and uh, multiple lags for, for precipitation, so from zero to 200 days with a five-day increment. Um, we, we ran the first time the model, which by the way are random forest models, and uh, um, out of the results of this model, we can uh, rank uh, the predictors uh, to identify which are the most important. And so at the end of this first step, we keep only the most important variables, and then we run a second uh, random forest model with only those ones uh, to, uh, to, to, to make the, the, the model and to validate it uh, over, over the, the data we have. Um, here are some uh, results. Uh, so for all the countries we worked on, of course, you can imagine that there is no hydropower generation in all countries in Europe, for instance, in Luxembourg and Belgium. I think it's, uh, if not zero, very, very low. So we did it only for the significant countries. Um, what you have uh, on the top is for runoff and on the bottom is for reservoirs. Uh, what you can see is that, yeah, the, the, the final model we kept is the one in dark green. Uh, which is called MULT for multiple parameters. Uh, it shows the Pearson correlation uh, between uh, our reconstruction and the uh, TSO data. And you can see that uh, uh, it's much better for, I, uh, for runoff than it is for reservoirs first. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, the Pearson correlations are good enough and uh, I would say even uh, very good uh, for uh, runoff. Uh, with a correlation coefficient so greater than 0.95 in most cases. Um, and uh, uh, the light gray bar, so the one on the, on the right for each plot, um, is uh, a version of the model in which we introduced as well the snow depth uh, variable from ERA5. Uh, you can see that in some cases it improves very slightly the results, but it's not automatic. And uh, in addition, as we want to use uh, the same models for seasonal forecast and climate projections, and also considering that snow depth is not available in, in some cases for those models, we decided to drop off the, the variable and to uh, keep on the precipitation and their uh, lagged uh, version. Um, so uh, once the model is built, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that the models are built, of course, on the period where uh, NSOE data is available, and this is from 2015 for all the models, all the countries, uh, and this data come from the NSOE transparency platform. And so once the, the models are set up, we can use the full ERA5 data set for temperature and precipitation to reconstruct uh, the uh, generation from runoff river, in that case, and uh, uh, reservoirs in that case. So if I come back to runoff, for instance, uh, you can uh, see that uh, in some cases, the viability of the signal in the, in the years prior to 2015 are quite, is quite similar to what we have on the, on the training period. Uh, but for some countries, it's not the case, for instance, for Slovakia which means that uh, basically we are not able with this kind of model to reproduce accurately uh, the amplitude of the uh, daily variability. Uh, but for most countries, it's not so bad, and we're quite confident that uh, the reconstructed signal, even if it does not provide the, uh, the right amplitude, gives at least a good representation of low and high uh, generation periods. Uh, of course, the results are, uh, it's, it's not seen on that one, but I, we could see that on the uh, Pearson correlation uh, graphs. Uh, the results are a little bit uh, um, less good for uh, reservoir generation uh, because uh, reservoir generation, as I said, is impacted highly by uh, the way people operate their dams and use the water and the reservoirs uh, to, to face the demand. So the link with climate is less obvious. Um, for a few countries, including France, we have data prior to 2015, and so this is uh, data from RTE in France, and you can see that the uh, data we constructed in red 
as I mentioned, is not able to uh, fully capture all the daily variability of the observed signal in blue, uh, but uh, uh, more or less we are not that, uh, we are quite happy with the results in the sense that uh, it can uh, simulate uh, in a rather good way the high and low uh, generation periods. So, uh, a quick summary before giving you uh, some more additional information. So, we set up very simple models uh, based on not zero aggregated climate variables. So, it's really rough uh, and very simple, but gives good results, particularly for, for runoff. Um, of course, we are absolutely aware that this can be improved and we're, we're still working on that. Uh, but for the, for the for the sake and for the, the, the targets of the project, we think it's it's already uh, quite a good achievement. Um, and uh, uh, one point is that of course it would require comparison comparison with more data, which are difficult to get, and or to also compare with uh, hydrological models outputs, uh, which might be the scope of a of the next contract or parallel activities. Um, we have also started to uh, calculate the signal forecast based on these models. So basically, we use the same models, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, essential climate variables are replaced by those provided by the signal forecast model. So this is an example for runoff uh, for the forecast from 1st of January 2018. So we can see that we get a probabilistic uh, forecast, and we will come back to that in the next webinar, which will be uh, specifically about signal forecast in July. Uh, this is the equivalent for the uh, reservoir generation. Uh, and I would like to say just a few words about uh, something else we are, we are trying to do because some users uh, mentioned to us that they are not interested in the generation itself, but more uh, in the inflows to reservoirs. And uh, um, continuing, there is a, a, an extra variable available on NSOE data, uh, which is the aggregated filling rate data. Uh, which is not Vstock. Uh, yeah, it's Vstock on the, on the, on the equations. Uh, we can uh, simply assume that the inflows, which, yeah, again, it's the uh, amount of water expressed in energy, which uh, comes to the reservoirs, is uh, equals to the variation of the stock, which is the filling rate from one week to the following, and the sum of the uh, generation during the, that same week. Uh, because you have to notice that filling rate is available only on weekly uh, uh, timescales. So basically, you can reconstruct this data from the previous ones, from uh, generation and uh, filling rate. And uh, where we set up the models. I will skip the details because I'm out of time, but I, what I want to mention is that we uh, also brought a new uh, improvement, which is to have the model in two steps, in three steps, in fact. So we still have the first one to identify the most relevant variables concerning the multiple lags. And then uh, we run the models with the most important variables. But then we can also uh, consider the residuals of this model and build a new one, a new model for the residuals. And then if we add the, the, the two, we, we get a better estimation as is shown on, I will skip all this, on this plot. Uh, so this is the uh, inflow reconstruction, so inflow to reservoirs reconstruction in terms of correlation and mean absolute percentage error. So the blue bars are for the direct model only, so the two-step model I presented earlier, and the, right, the red one is if we uh, also add uh, uh, an extra layer of the um, modelization of the residuals of the first model. And you can see that it provides a, a, a very good improvement apparently, so this is still work in progress and needs to be a uh, uh, further validated, but we uh, we think it's uh, it's a very good uh, way and a very good path to to improve the models. And Alberto says it's my time is over, so I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Laurent, for the great overview of uh, of all this work that has been done. As I said, there is a lot of uh, detail that uh, is uh, uh, behind the presentation. So we do have questions now, but uh, as I said, then uh, you, I'll give you the link also for learning more about this. So we got um, a few minutes for questions and I we received several. I'm 
copying them now so everybody can see them and also where they the questions are from who asked them and i'll ask to give short answers there's um, a few questions for each presenter mainly for laura i think but uh, also one for if marie so if we can start quickly laurent on uh, you'll see the questions now showing no, uh, we do not you don't and uh, and we'll uh, fix that soon okay so you see it now no we see a mail from steve <laughs> yes okay now okay Okay, so the first one about Ocean IXS NSOE. So it's NSOE is a public data set. So if you just type NSOE into Google, you will find a website very easily. And then there's a data uh, tab in which you can go either to the statistics uh, page or to the uh, transparency portal, transparency platform page. Uh, and everything is indicated how to get the data and to ask for an API key, key, key and so on. So it's quite easy to, to do. Um, and I think I don't understand the remaining part of the question. Or can we use non-EU country into NSOE? NSOE is about Europe, so basically it's the uh, the entity uh, in Europe for uh, putting in common uh, data, but many other aspects as well. But uh, uh, so if you live in a non-EU country, you need to refer to your own country's transmission system operator or energy authority. Uh, to find similar data if you want to build uh, such models. I will, I will go with the, with the next one, maybe. Uh, so I understand, yeah, it's a question about the hourly time resolution in, uh, in the uh, demand models. So, um, Michel, to answer your question, uh, the contract uh, is aimed to work on daily resolution for demand and hydro power. Uh, hourly resolution currently is only for solar and wind. Um, power so uh, basically it's feasible to do hourly uh, demand models and uh, by the way we do it internally for some project at EDF uh, in the current contract it's not planned um, but this is something we're probably going to discuss with the CMWF uh, but yeah it, it's in principle it's feasible it's not planned but uh, it, it might be an extra of the contract uh, in the coming months. So I can't be uh, fully affirmative, but uh, most likely it will be possible. Okay, thank, thank you, Laurent. And the next Marie, one. the next one is for you, I think. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So regarding the PV model, um, well, actually, the calculation has been, I've been developed on my uh, laptop. It's a very normal uh, PC and uh, it, it works once fine. So the CPU needs are not uh, prohibitive for, for running the computation. What is, uh, what is um, a problem is just uh, the, 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 the handling of the data. So we make it sequential, which just take a lot of time because the first thing is just to extract the data. So we're using a NetCDF file that are uh, just uh, optimized to, to be read uh, uh, time step after time step, and uh, this has to be done sequentially. So one improvement may consist in uh, parallelizing the calculation, uh, and then it can be done quite fast. Uh, but for the calculation itself, it's really not uh, that time demanding. It's only the sequential approach which is uh, a problem. Now, considering the, the optimized one, it is really a straightforward calculation which can be done on every, every uh, PC laptop uh, in a really fast, uh, really, really fast. So it's just some linear combination and ready. So, excellent. So, uh, Michel, can you, you can start to use the model and let us know how it goes. And uh, thanks, Yves Marie, for the answer. So, now we've got three questions from uh, Etienne. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop after this because we're okay. over time. But so, if you can give some quick answers, please. Yeah, yeah I think it will be quite quick. Uh, the first one about must once increase the wind power electricity. <clears throat> uh, I, 
I, I think so. Uh, I think it's more, uh, I would say, a political question than, uh, than a scientific one, but uh, uh, it is planned. Uh, currently, we have 15 gigawatts or, or so of installed capacity for wind power, and the target is uh, something like 26, if I remember well, by 2025. So, yeah, wind power will rise in, in, in France, especially uh, offshore uh, with the development of several parks. There are some political issues, social acceptability issues, and so on, but it, it's, it's developing. And then the second one, uh, why back to 20, 1979 and not forward to 2020? As I explained, what we presented today is the uh, reconstruction of wind power uh, generation on the era five period, which covers 1979 to present. And then uh, we will do also uh, climate projections. Uh, which will go much beyond 2020 because we will go until 2100, considering two um, climate scenarios, so namely LCP 4.5 and 8.5, and 12 models. So there will be information about that and uh, about the uh, reanalysis period, so back to 1979. What you need to know is that the goal of that project is to deliver operational products by the end of the contract next uh, next May last uh, next year. And so um, the uh, data sets uh, based on the run analysis will be updated regularly, uh, probably every, every quarter or something like that, uh, to take into account the latest uh, climate data available to provide the uh, update of the energy variables, not only for wind, but also for the other variables. And uh, uh, about the uh, presumption that Ron and Ryan are going to stop flowing, uh, I would say it's probably a little bit extreme, and uh, the, the, this contract is absolutely not intended to answer this kind of question. Um, I think it's a, a, a debate for ideologists, but uh, uh, for sure there will be impacts of climate change on, the, uh, on river, um, river flows in the future in Europe uh, with some uh, um, impacts already uh, identified now and that will probably increase in the future. Uh, and I would just like to invite you to come back to our next webinars uh, to see what our approach is and what our model uh, can give us information about this, uh, this aspect. Okay, thank you very much, Laurent. And uh, um, these are the questions so far, but if you have other questions, uh, as I said, we don't have time to address them now. We can uh, take them and answer them uh, separately by email later. Okay, just to conclude then, I just wanted to uh, mention that we actually have another activity for Citrus Energies. And these are uh, two stakeholder workshops that are happening on the 26th of June in uh, Denmark. And this is uh, alongside the 6th International Conference Energy Meteorology. So that's running from 24th to 27th of June in Copenhagen in just over a month and you find information on the link here. Uh, then in terms of other webinars, this was the second one we've held uh, of this series. Uh, you can actually find all the webinars from the previous contracts, so the ESM contracts, also on uh, the uh, WEMC web pages. But the next ones for this contract are on the 5th of July on seasonal forecast, as was mentioned already. And then on the uh, and the fourth one will be in September, date to be confirmed for climate projections, and one in November to present uh, case studies that we're working on uh, for energy. And uh, so that's the outlook. And if you'd like to view uh, hear the recordings and download the presentations, these are available. The one for today will be available soon at the website here. And if you'd like more information about the C3S energy contract, you can visit the web, the C3S webpage here. So thank you for your attention and we look forward to having you again uh, on the 5th of uh, July for the next webinar and um, perhaps also in uh, Denmark for the stakeholder workshops. Have a great day and thank you again for your uh, attendance.